Silverberg, Director of the Center for Nonprofit Studies at Austin Community College, and welcome to Civil Society, where we explore issues affecting our communal well being through a nonprofit lens. We're a proud partner of Austin Community College TV, but given COVID 19, we're going virtual for our fourth season. Our center is fully committed to being an anti racist organization, to accelerating our personal learning journeys, confronting our biases and blind spots and creating opportunities for others to do the same. This episode is part of our series on the Hispanic Latinx experience in Austin. In January, we'll explore the Asian Pacific Islander uh, American and then the Native American indigenous peoples experiences in Austin. You can access recordings of earlier episodes and sign up for uh, future programs at nonprofitaustin.org slash civil society. We recently completed our nine part series on the black experience in Austin. I'm thrilled that my guest today is Martha Cotera, a nationally recognized feminist, historian, independent scholar, and since 1974, a business owner, publisher, and archivist consultant at UT's noted Benson Latin American uh, collection. She's the author of groundbreaking feminist texts including Goddess and Women, History and Heritage of Chicanas in the United States, in the US, The Chicana Feminist, and Multicultural Women's Sourcebook. Her writings also include more than 100 other books, essays, and articles on archives, history, and civil rights issues. To put it shortly, put it briefly, she's a very busy lady. Uh, <laughs> In her oral history at the Latina History Project at Southwestern University, which I really enjoyed listening to, she speaks about playing amidst Anasazi runes in Casa Grande, Chihuahua, Mexico, and growing up with a strong consciousness of her indigenous roots and the values of her ancestors. Her upbringing was infused with a strong dose of progressive politics because her grandparents were very involved in Mexican politics. Emigrating to El Paso in 1946, she encountered racist policies in both elementary school and high school. After marrying Juan Cotera, she moved to Austin in 1963 so Juan could continue his education in architecture at the University of Texas. Although they encountered what she described as extreme racism in Austin, they were determined to stay and help transform the city. Martha was hired as director of documents at the Texas State Library in Austin. Later in 1968, she became director of Southwest educational development and was put in charge of 28 libraries across the state of Texas. Later, she and Juan were involved in numerous community ventures, including to help found uh, Jacinto Trevino College as a college for Mexican Americans to prepare teachers for bilingual, bicultural education programs. Involved in the farm workers movement, Martha and her husband helped found and structure the Raza Unida Party, a third political party centered on Chicano nationalism. Eventually, she and other women act active in the party began to feel marginalized by the male leadership of the movement. So they established a women's caucus within the party. Martha is a founding member of over 23 local, state and national organizations advocating for women and families. She's the recipient of numerous national state and local awards for scholarship, leadership and civic activism. She's been influential in helping found or serving as a charter member of organizations that are now Austin landmarks, including the Rape Crisis Center and Center for Battered Women known as Safe Place, the Austin Lyric Opera, the Greater Austin Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Blanton Museum, the Mexicart uh, Museum, the Center for Mexican American Studies at UT, and the Texas Center for Educational Policy at UT. She remains an active volunteer at the MSS Barrientos Mexican American Cultural Center, which she, uh, for which she spearheaded construction of the center and continues to involve, uh, be involved there as a volunteer. She's currently an independent translator and community consultant and remains active in local politics and community initiatives. Martha, I'm exhausted by just reading your credentials, okay? It just, I've looked forward to chatting with you since I 
started reading about your background. It's absolutely fascinating. Yours is a life really well lived, a life that's been fully engaged in healing our world and fighting for social justice while still being true to your own roots. And I think that is extremely admirable. So I'm honored that you join us and I'm looking forward to you sharing your wisdom with us. So uh, let's start by talking about Martha Katera, the activist. So you grew up amidst the Anasazi rooms and absorbing the wisdom of your ancestors. Uh, number one, just for context, who are the Anasazis and what was your life like as a child in Chihuahua, Mexico? Well, the, the Anasazi, uh, a day or say in our area in Casas Grandes uh, from maybe the 11th century, uh, but they're recognized more uh, about the 13th century. And it's part of a stream of town of, um, it's a huge culture that expands uh, Arizona, New Mexico and Chihuahua. And that's what, uh, what binds us. There are Casas Grandes, uh, in New Mexico, Casa Dandes in Arizona, and then Casa Dandes in Chihuahua. The uh, best they're known for is their architecture, which is uh, Pueblo architecture. So if you go to the ruins where I grew up, uh, they weren't they weren't discovered discovered yet. It was so funny when UT discovered them. Uh, because we, I, I shared that with my good friend, Bobby. I need to give a shout out to my good friend, Bobby. She, she knows all this history. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing here, Bobby, but thank you for, for being in my corner today, a, a fellow traveler here in Austin. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, they're known for their aesthetic. Uh, they're known for their architecture. Um, and uh, also in, in my uh, family's lifetime, they're known for carrying the history of, uh, of resistance against empires because they resisted the, the Aztec empire. And so when we found the little clay coins in the mounds, when it rained, the, the coins would be, uh, and, and the uh, necklaces would be uncovered. And of course we would sneak them out of the mounds and, and take them to our you know play areas to put on our dolls. And my grandmother uh, would make us take them back and hide them. You know, and so if you can imagine, you know, put them back in the mounds because uh, they belong to our ancestors and we were not to take them away. Uh, but the, the biggest discovery to me, and I don't know if it's true or not, of course, because this is grandparent talk, was the little uh, ceramic um, coins that we found, ceramic uh, cylinder um, <clears throat> items. Uh, they said we're called Moctezumas, and they said that that was some kind of receipt for the tribute that you paid to the Aztecs. So today in Austin, like when when um, at the MAC, they want to do this this thing about, oh, Aztec, everything Aztec is beautiful. I like pull out my hair and say, don't you know that half of the nation resisted the Aztec Empire and that they were colonizers in a lot of our areas? In, in my area, they would accept it as merchants and they were good traders. So, you know, we would trade and I guess pay tribute, you know, and have the little Montezumas uh, as receipts. Uh, apparently, that's what my grandmother said. Anyway, I, I grew up with that kind of, in that kind of resistance mode. So I guess, and I always say that, um, that Mexicanos and, and people throughout the Americas, that people the Americas have always been in resistance mode uh, since, you know, in, in Peru it was the Incas and then, and then it was the Aztecs in Mexico and Central America, they, they governed there too. And so when the Europeans came, I think we were ready to continue the resistance. Well, how, how has, well, some extent you just answered it, but to expand on, how has knowing your history and being comfortable with your history and yourself and your, your, your culture? Well, uh, your life those are, yes, sir. Those of us that are, that are lucky enough to grow close to our parents, grow up close to our parents and grandparents um, can learn a lot because like in my case, in my with my mom, I can learn everything that happened from the 1919. For example, I know that she was born during the Spanish flu, and that's why they moved to a rural area, to the farm, to the family farms, you know, so that um, so the family would not be uh, affected. I know from my grandparents 
uh, our history go my history knowledge goes way back through my grandmother because she's native of the area where I was born and my grandfather who was born in another area but whose family uh, was um, was given a land grant in Texas and then in 1848 they decided to go back to Mexico uh, and of course they landed in Mexico and within 20 years there was a, a terrible terrible war so I learned about the French invasion uh and what happened and and what the family suffered as refugees he had to go to chihuahua literally walked to chihuahua with his parents and that's where he met my grandmother so you learn this history but i think that along with the history um it's not just history because people will talk about values you know people will talk about why they reacted uh, uh, why they supported the Mexican Revolution, because it meant separation of church and state, uh, because it meant communal land uh, properties uh, were protected, because it meant uh, greater equality for the, for the indigenous and Mexicano community, and, um, and you know, more uh, distribution of income in an equitable way, you learn these values as you learn family history. And, and I think that's that's just really important because this never goes away. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about the Chicano struggle for human rights and human and civil rights. Um, I know this is sort of a very broad question, but we're limited in time, obviously. But what do you believe are the most important things that both Hispanics and Anglos ought to know about that struggle? Well, I think that uh, for most of us, and like I said, I'm lucky, but all of us share that family history. So the Chicano movement is an episode or, or part of a stream of resistance that I, most of us, you know, date back to pre-Hispanic times and to definitely colonial times, you know, so it's a stream of resistance. The indigenous community, the native Mexican American community in Mexico and in Texas and in the rest of the US, you know, has always been on this track. So the movement was just kind of like a massive stop you know, where there was a confluence of other movements and it was very exciting to join, you know, to, to add our value to the movements uh, that were going on at the same time. But it was definitely a, for us, as for the African-American communities and for women, a movement of liberation, a women, a movement that promoted above all, uh, you know, va uh, values of liberation, values of humanity, recognizing, very similar to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, recognizing the humanity in all of us and then um, demanding that we be fully recognized as citizens. So basically that's, that's the essence of the movement, a movement for liberation, a movement to acquire full citizenship. And like I said, we made a lot of strides but we're still a long ways from full citizenship for most of the people in the US, not just for Mexicanos, but for most of the people, including poor people, you know, Absolutely. because poor people do not have full citizenship. Superb. When you, when you published uh, your book, uh, Women, uh, Goddess and Women, uh, The History and Heritage of Chicana in the US in 1976, 76, it generated a great deal of interest among Chicana students and the women's movement. What was it about this book that, and, and you, whatever you presented in the book, that caused such a stir um, and helped spur more thinking and involvement? Well, I think like a lot of feminist texts in um, 1970, uh, 68, 70 uh, era, uh, it was a curtain racer, you know, uh, being a librarian and, and an archivist, what I wanted to do, and not an elegant text, just like, ooh, every time I, I read back on it, it was, I meant it as an outline. I meant it as a, you know, period piece where, where uh, people could lift the curtain a little bit and see, you know, representative women, 
So it was by no means a, a deep, 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 deep study, but representative women uh, that were acting in the moment, but that came from a historical base and then were moving toward a future, uh, positive future for other women. So that my idea was that teachers, scholars, students could uh, focus on a piece, uh, for example, Elizabeth Salas focused on the soldaderas, you know, the women that that worked in, that fought in the revolution, Mexico's revolution on both sides of the border and did a wonderful, 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 wonderful piece and other people have too. Other people have focused on Our Lady of Guadalupe and have done amazing studies. And so other women uh, that were contemporaries, Ana Nieto Gomez, uh, Adela Sosa, I mean, I can name, you know, so many women scholars uh, an activist that wrote pieces, but uh, we were all writing kind of piecemeal. And I thought, okay, I'm a librarian. I can put this information together and something like 10 months, you know, I put down what is basically just an outline piece, but it's an outline piece that has the information references, but it also has um, uh, kind of point pointers, you know, for example, uh, reimagining Our Lady of Guadalupe for what she is, and that she is the continuation of the goddess creator of Mexico. So there's a reason why women will forever, you know, venerate the Virgin because she represents the the new, the Mexicana, but also the goddess tradition, the tradition that women brought with them when they became part of the colonial system. You know, and so I did things like that. So we did La Llorona. I don't know if I remember Targeta Llorona, but I did um, other women that La Malinche, you know, Doña Marina, the the layson person, an interpreter for the Spanish and the native communities during the conquest. And I, along with other women, but in my book, you know, we recovered her, we reimagined her position and we said, no, we are not again going to be chastised for having been raped basically during the conquest because no woman has to be raped. She just does the best she can for survive to survive. And, and it's, um, it's really wonderful that even today, uh, not too long ago, Denise Hernandez uh, produced La, um, ¿cómo se llama? La Chingada. I forget what, if, I, I don't know what she, um, I can't remember the film now, but it was a, a, an essay, um, a series of, of uh, interviews with, with young women about give me, okay, oh, la chingona, give me your definition of chingona. And it was right on, despite the fact that we haven't had women's studies in the high schools and ethnic studies. But anyway, so uh, it was a curtain racer, but the, the, Thing about the reason why we wrote it or we all wrote feminist text at that time was because the men in the movement thought that liberation man, uh, meant liberation for men. And I think a lot of men still feel that way, that they mean, you know, liberation is for men only because they're the only humans, you know, and that the rest of us, you know, had to do the dishes. And the other thing that they thought is that our culture, we realized that our, they thought our, cult, our culture was actually only raising children and doing dishes, you know, and that it did not be go beyond logistics, you know, that that's all that women were good for, you know, like like a cow or like a horse, you know, logistics, you know, they were good there for, you know, to make sure the men stayed alive, I guess. And, um, and the other thing that made us write texts like this at that time was that if women's presence uh, as, as spokespeople and as leaders or prominent followers or whatever it is, if their participation uh, was not enabled in a real way, then the values that we wanted to promote, the policies that we wanted to promote were not at the table. And so when I say that the men were having all the fun, I mean it, you know, they thought that the movement was all about you know, making speeches and drinking and having fun and going after all the women they could go. And Bobby will back me up on this. 
And so it was very important to say, no, women need to participate because we are also after liberation and because our values and our policy needs and issues need to be at the table. So it was, we had to do it. So in the article about you in Wikipedia, okay, and I think you're the first person I've talked to who has and actually has an article in Wikipedia, so congratulations. Uh, it says that you wrote the book as a response to rampant misogyny within the Chicano nationalist and political movements. I think you've just described how it manifested itself in other interviews that I read. Uh, you talked about how the guys, quote, the guys did a lot of talking and fun stuff like you're saying right now. So, <laughs> What what did you and your colleagues do to change that? What did you do to, as you said, get a seat at the table mm -hmm. and to move things along in what you believe was the right direction? Well, what we did is we did uh, we did a lot of writing, uh, and then we used the same text as consciousness racing. So we had caucuses. We had a caucus within the party. And then we had a broader caucus of political, political activists within the community and the movement as a whole. And then we had a caucus and we were founders of the uh, National Women's Political Caucus and the Texas Women's Political Caucus because we wanted to you know, bring the issues, bring policy issues. Uh, Rosie um, Castro has said it beautifully, she says, we, we were not looking for Chingon leadership for ourselves. We were looking for meaningful participation for ourselves. We didn't care who led as long as our issues were at the table. So that was the important, the important thing. And, and the issues were not getting at the table if women did not um, uh, participate in a meaningful way. So, so we trained uh, community, we, we went and had meetings all over the state with community me, uh, women. Uh, we realized that community women felt uncomfortable in the public sphere, and, and that's understandable. We had to convince women that it'd be fine to just be powerful at home and at church if the children stayed at home in a church, but their children were out in the community, you know, getting killed, you know, and being discriminated. And so they had to be out there in the public sphere. And within a year, we had eight women candidates in Crystal City under the Razonida party. And in fact, our Razonida candidate, Lieutenant Governor um, Alma was just barely met the minimum age to, to participate. And so we were very, very successful in convincing women that the public sphere was also their responsibility, you know? And I think it has remained that way. It has remained that way. I am so happy. That is one of the big um, gains that I think the Chicano movement had is to bring women in Latinas into the public sphere. Picking up on that, how does the struggles and the movement uh, in the days you, you're just talking about compared to what's going on today? Oh, I, I, I think I just said it. I don't know how, uh, well, I do know how this continued to, to, to be at the forefront. Um, but I think that because of the women in the movement did not you know, go back home, so to speak, but that uh, the great majority of us remained involved. In fact, here in Austin, uh, we established the Mexican American Business and Professional Women uh, that included, you know, Republican, Democrats, and Razonida women, included LGBTQ women, because it, it is true that um, in a lot of times they didn't feel comfortable in the movement. And through this organization, we continued movement activities. I established a nonprofit Chicana Research and Learning Center to push for women's studies at UT, Latina studies at UT, and it came, happened. Uh, we pushed to develop ethnic studies at UT, and it happened. So the movement never stopped. And fortunately, uh, the women in the movement never stopped. I can name, I mean, Margaret Gomez, Commissioner Gomez, uh, activist Bobby here with us, activist and founder of institutions in San Marcos and in Austin. And so we continued community building. 
you know, we, it, the movement never stopped for women. All right. I want to leave some of those kinds of questions to our audience. So let me move to another area, sort of self-reflection. Okay. So um, I mean this as a compliment. You don't seem like a patient person. Okay. You seem like you want to get results. All right. So how do you deal with, as a leader, how do you deal with the frustrations of the glacial pace of change? Well, the way I deal with it is I, I, I look back in a very positive way. I look back and people complain to me. My granddaughter sometimes complains and I say, hey, when I set up my business, I couldn't even get a phone for my business. My husband had to go sign, which he did just gleefully. I mean, I've never seen him so happy. I had signed the phone checks for 20 years and I could not get a phone line on my own. And so we did something about that. We did something about women's credit. We did, we did something about the ERA. We're still struggling for the ERA. Uh, we, did, we did something to make things happen. And so women are not in the same place. Men, uh, men of color are not in the same place. And so I look back, the way I deal with frustrations is I look back and I say, look at all we did. I mean, we have a multi-million dollar Mexican American Cultural Center. Uh, we have Mexicato Museum. We have institutions, our institutions in our community um, compared to the past in, in communities of color are first rate, including libraries. When, uh, when I was struggling as the library commission, commissioner, um, uh, Ida May Kirk and I had to switch vacation, uh, could not go on vacation at the same time because they closed the black library or they closed our library. And so none of that is happening because we made policy a very important part and voting a very important part of the uh, communities of color agenda. So I look back, I deal with my frustrations by looking back and saying, look at what the road that we have traveled and look at the wonderful things we have achieved. And if we achieve this much, you know, in the past, we can certainly keep moving and keep building and keep achieving. So looking back, but also looking forward, okay? Knowing what you know today, what would you say to that little girl playing in the Asazi rooms? <laughs> okay, that she ought to know for her to have the greatest life possible? Well, um, that was a very difficult question because um, I, made, I made some decisions that were frankly kind of stupid in my own personal uh, professional uh, trajectory. Um, I, I very often fall in love with a notion of something that I want to do. Like I fell in love. I helped set up the Mexican Mary Library Project at UT, an archival project. And I fell in love with the idea of being the queen of, you know, uh, Mexican American Library projects all over the nation and having the very best, amazing, you know, archive. Well, that was not to be because I could not be hired. Um, sometimes you, you lose things because you're gaining other things. So I could not be hired because I was too radical in my politics with wrestling in a party. I had been a candidate uh, for State Board of Education and I was very prominent in the party. And so they frankly told me, there's no way that they're going to approve your appointment. Uh, and stupid me, I accepted a 10 hour a week appointment that uh, meant that I had to find other ways of earning a living. And so I didn't do as good a job as I could have done there because I couldn't afford to spend, you know, 80 hours a week on it. And, um, and I did not become the queen of, you know, archives like I wanted to be, the goddess of information basically is what I wanted to be. And, and I didn't become that. And um, I, also, I also did not take the time uh, and effort to get a PhD and I should have, done that because I would have been a very happy, you know, teacher, I think, professor in higher education. However, I have a daughter that did that. So my daughter's going to come teach at UT this coming January, and I am very happy. And she's an amazing feminist scholar, you know, and, and has a wonderful uh, website called Chicana Por Mi Raza that, is, that compiles uh, histories like mine 
from throughout the nation and puts them up there. This is what I wanted to do. And it's okay. I mean, I, I'm okay with it, but I still want it to be goddess of information. They I think it. you've done pretty well despite that. <laughs> so um, I, I, I asked you before we got on the show about lessons learned and you said you don't learn lessons well. Uh, I, I don't agree with that, but that's besides the point. So what lessons have you learned? What, what is it that you have told your daughter, told your granddaughter? Uh, what would you like to tell the younger folks today uh, that they ought to keep in mind as they engage in resistance and in, in civil struggles in trying to change the world? Well, I, I think one of the hardest lessons for uh, uh, that's been hard for me to learn is I have very um, I'm very judgmental uh, about people and I have very high standards and I get very easily annoyed and so I have not always delegated very uh, wisely um, or not delegated at all and and that's not good but then I really uh, to, to tell you the truth I do not consider myself a leader I hate that word. I really, really do because I think that people ought to be ought to just take on projects and do them, and and it's all situational because you may not be the best person to take a particular project, you know, and let somebody else do it. I'm very good at doing that, but I'm not as good, and I have to remind myself time and time and time again every day to trust uh, uh, young people more. You know, and, and whenever I, I start thinking, oh my gosh, what are they thinking? You know, and uh, who do they think they are? They're only like 22. Uh, and then, uh, you know, or 24 or whatever, then I remember that uh, my mentors uh, in El Paso, uh, Elizabeth Kelly and Marcel Hamer, uh, trusted me enough to say, go after running a department. And I started working with them, I was 18. And when I was 19, 19 and when I was 20, they said, go run a department. And I did. I actually, you know, they turned the department uh, loose. I mean, I have to remember that. I have to remember that. I have to remember Greg Casar. Oh my gosh, that man is amazing. Um, I have to remember Larissa Davila, another, you know, young person that'll just do magic. That's, that's what I have to remind myself every single day that, you know, um, that having 56 years of experience doesn't make you the goddess of anything. No. <laughs> well, I think that's a very powerful message. We all have to realize that part of our role in, I'll, I'll use the word leadership, is to give other people the opportunities mm -hmm. to help change the world as well. So. Uh, I've got ton more questions, but we've got a, an audience, and I assume they've got a few questions. Um, and so I'm going to open up uh, to the audience if you would turn your cameras on if you want. Um, and we're open for questions either through the chat box, or uh, you can just raise your hand and ask away. Okay, do we have anything out there? Hi, I'll ask a question. Uh, hello, my name is Janelle Blank. And uh, hi. Um, I was really thankful that Kate had sent out the email about this because um, I'm, I'm to the point in my life and I'm, I'm in my early 40s. And even though I'm Mexicana in the sense that I'm a descendant, because my uh, great grandfather migrated in the 1800s, and we've researched that on both sides of the family. And my maiden name is Pena, and my mom's maiden name is Ortiz. But because I was raised in an all white school in an all white town. And because my parents, because of the discrimination did not teach me Spanish. So I'm really good at saying, yo no, es, uh, no hablo espanol and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. What advice do you have outside of reading? Cause like now I've looked you up, I've ordered your books. They'll be here on Saturday and I'm gonna be reading. But what other advice do you have for young Latinas who want to know more about our culture, but we're losing it with every generation that we're here. <laughs> I forgot to unplug my phone. I'm so sorry. Um, you know, I would 
I just say read, 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 and read. And, and there's so amazing, amazing works, really good works. And I didn't bring down one, uh, but there's the Chicana Feminist Thought. You can see the, you can see how I put the papers. Chicana Feminist Thought that, that has wonderful essays. Uh, Chicana, uh, and they're all history of feminism, Chicana Feminism. Uh, Chicana Movidas that has essays about um, Chicanas in the women's movement. And I have an, a long essay in there. Uh, there's Chicana Power. You know, this is an excellent, also women in the movement. This is particularly about women in the Chicano movement and, uh, and has a lot of history. Uh, you told me to recommend some books. Uh, one of the general books that's pretty good, there's very, there's quite a few, Manuel Gonzalez, Mexicanos in the U.S. And I don't like Rudy um, Acuna a whole lot because he can be very sexist, has been. But his book, Occupied America, was uh, one of the first texts uh, that give, gives you a whole range of the, the history um, if I'm not mistaken, it goes back to, to colonial times uh, and mostly history of a resistance movement. Uh, the other thing that we're working on is uh, we're working on ethnic studies requirement for high school graduation in Texas. You know, they give us a little bit and then we take a whole lot. So we just got approval for ethnic studies uh, courses last year. I worked on that uh, project. And now we're saying, let's make it a high school requirement because I think that ethnic studies and uh, Mexican American emphasis or others is a really great way for everybody in the community to get curious about their own history. So I, I whenever I was isolated from resources and, and I wanted to get myself um, you know, into into that informed sphere. I would just read. I would read, 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 read. Uh, when I was four, I learned to read, and they wouldn't let me read anything but the Bible. And let me tell you, I got a lot of education reading the Bible, a lot, much more than anybody would recommend for a four-year-old. I don't know how to cut that off. <laughs> no, why don't we just ignore it? Don't worry you about what, it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn my phone off. Sorry. Okay. So oh, I, 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 I wanted to make it make a comment. So I, I didn't have the last, I'm, I'm half and half, okay? Half Hispanic and half, half Anglo as my mother would have put it. Um, but my name is 100% gringa. And one of the, th and I lived in, in, in the Valley and I've lived in the Midwest. And I think, um, and I grew up with don't speak Spanish with my mother, although with my grandparents, that's all I heard in the house. Mm -hmm. And I, I know what I did. I pushed, I pushed that limit because I was always put in a box no matter where I was, whether I was down south or up north. So in the valley, I was the gringa or la bolilla, right? The white girl. And when I went up north and lived in um, the Midwest, you know, they would see my olive complected skin and they would say, oh, you have such lovely olive complexion. What are you? And I used to think, what the hell do you mean? What am I? Um, but I pushed through with language and all the education beyond reading. So even now, like a lot of us don't have time for reading, but there's a lot of educational material out there if you can't um, do that. Language was really um, crucial in bridging that, that divide. Um, and so, yeah, I just everything you can do to like immerse yourself in the culture. But I really get that don't speak Spanish thing. Um, but it, it, was, it was a little bit ridiculous, but I get it in that day and time. It was necessary. I mean, my mother failed kindergarten because she couldn't uh, speak English. So, but but I hear you. Thank you for hearing that. Yeah, I think one of the most frustrating things is when I get told by my elders, uh, you know, you just need to learn Spanish. If you want to learn about your culture, just learn Spanish. I grew up in a Spanish speaking household and yet I still didn't learn Spanish. So, you know, I listened to the Hano music I know who Vicente Fernandez is. I watch the novellas, but yet I still don't speak Spanish. But um, I appreciate you uh, talking about it, Heather, and knowing that uh, there's similar experiences. I know there's a lot of people in my generation where our parents were the transition generation because my grandparents didn't speak English. My parents spoke both. And then I don't speak Spanish and my children don't speak Spanish. 
So my children struggle because their father is also Anglo. And, um, and because the traditions we have are mostly surrounded by food. All the food that I make is Mexican. And so my kids, when their friends would come around and said, oh, do you eat Mexican food every night? And my kids were like, this is just food. <laughs> we didn't really think about it that way. It's just food, it's just what mom makes. So between the food and the traditions and the family and the quinceañeras and the weddings and the funerals um, is how is the parts that I've been able to hold on to. So um, now I'm reaching out, like I talked to Kate, I said, oh, everything. I wanna hear everything and all the speakers we have at ACC so that I can make sure that I participate. So thank you again. Are there other questions? Let me just insert that from my own study of ethnic communities and particularly the Jewish community, there is a phenomenon of the third generation returning to the roots mm -hmm. and the third generation uh, is interested in what the second generation has left behind um, or the first generation tried to jettison. So I always keep that in mind as hopeful for my own tradition and I, there may be some value uh, Janelle, for you to think about for your kids, uh, that they will find interest in this and try to return to some of those roots. So, I'd like to say that one positive uh, development now in the Latino community, and I think part of it is is due to the gun violence um, issue and the um, uh, law enforcement coloniz extreme colonization issue of communities of color, is that we are looking. Um, and I have written extensively about mixed, about the, the way that we deal with uh, mestizo, mestizaje, the way that we deal with uh, children uh, that are in, in mixed, that are um, in mixed marriages, of mixed marriages, you know. Uh, we have always been kind, and I think that we're gaining a better awareness of that. We're dealing better with Afro Latino. Uh, heritage and history, uh, we're doing better, you know, with children of mixed heritage, because after all, uh, the majority of the Mexicano community is uh, mestizo, you know, we are the products of, of a, a mixed, you know, mixed marriages. And so having that heritage, we definitely should be the most understanding. And, and I have to say that the majority of our literature is in English. So you do not you know, I don't think, Ang, you know, your soul feels where your soul feels, you know, and those values, I used to tell my daughter, they're the, I used to say they're in our genes, and then she'd get very smart and say, what, Kevin Klein, or what? And I said, no, they're in our DNA. They really are. If the monarch butterflies can find their way, you know, through the generations, we definitely have these these, you know, values of aesthetics and spirituality and community and communitarianism and, uh, you know, not so, so much given to individualism that is negative. These are values that we have, you know, and so reading, you know, helps you rediscover and identify what you are feeling because you're definitely feeling them. I used to, you know, I used to talk about that all the time you know, your, your, your feelings are actually what drives you in a way for us because we don't know our history as well as we should know it. We don't know our heritage as well as we should know it. It's taken away from us. And everything that we're doing is like Gloria Saldua says, excavando, excavando, excavando. We literally dig into the mounds, you know, of our culture and our families to find you know, that which we know is already within us, but that we can identify. So yeah, it's a discovery process and I would go for it. It's a joy, joyful, joyful thing to do. Is there any other questions out there? We have a number of people who have made some comments in the chat. Um, I don't want to read them, but I think that some of those comments would be worthy of repeating on camera. So. If some of you would like to say some of the things you've said in chat, that would be great. I'd like to share something with, with the group. Um, I've known Marta for most of my life. <laughs> and so one of the things that she said to me early on uh, as, as a young woman in my 20s was, our children are not going to learn our traditions and our culture 
by osmosis. We have to take the time to teach them the history and the reasons why we have these traditions. Mm -hmm. And I really took that to heart. And my daughters have been completely uh, engrossed in learning about their culture and their heritage, not just the Mexicano, but the Espanol mm -hmm. and the Native American, because my mother is Native American. And so um, I am so grateful for that because it has totally changed the dynamic of our family when I came from a generation where we were being told not to speak English because our parents had been penalized or punished for having spoken Spanish in, in, the, in the schools. And so they, my parents tried very hard to not teach us Spanish so that we would not suffer the same consequences. Uh, I was lucky to have had grandparents that fostered um, the learning of the language but I'm the only one of my four siblings that learned it. And so um, thank you, Marta, for that. <laughs> and I should mention that Bobby will be uh, my guest in November. Oh. Uh, on the topic of uh, Hispanic women in Austin politics. So. Um, Lord have mercy. <laughs> Uh, I have to say that my mother was um, extreme. Um, she was the other. See, parents have different ways of dealing with it. She was she was the opposite extreme. She would not let us speak English at home. And so to this day, see what happens with upbringing. After five, I have a very difficult time speaking English. You know, or weekends. Oh my gosh, don't get me on the weekend. I'm totally on Spanish mode. She used to, she wanted to participate in our schooling so badly that she made me read the Brothers Karamazov in Spanish. And you haven't lived until you read Russian literature in Spanish. Um, and she made me read Shakespeare in Spanish so that she could read it with me and we could discuss it. But that was also, at that time, I thought she was nuts. Uh, but that, that was also a very good a lesson for me because my son had problem staying focused. So I would read all 15 of his, you know, government readings with him so that we, and high school readings too, so that we could discuss it. So um, parents have different ways of, of raising us, but thank God, you know, we, we survive and, um, and we thrive uh, if they're paying attention to, to, you know, to our development. And we need to talk about boys. I'm very supportive of the males program, by the way. And I have done a lot of reading on, on how to raise uh, boys that are, that are not given, that are not into this patriarchal and, and damaging and killing masculinists. And so um, I read in one text something that really pleased me. They said that the males movement should uh, read uh, feminist texts because uh, feminists, uh, concentrated on developing positive self concepts for women, you know, positive self concepts that would not be destructive of their selves and their, um, their individuality. And that man, that young men uh, need to do that in order to discover themselves, you know, as human beings and not as, you know, privileged uh, social beings. And so uh, I hope that in a nonprofit that, uh, that we just formed, uh, Larissa and I can uh, be looking at, um, at working with young, young, young Latino males. Any other questions? So Martha, have we not, is there anything that we haven't asked you that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, you, you were going to ask me, what, what am I doing? Um, I'm doing everything. Uh, I'm causing good trouble. I know. <laughs> we, we um, you know, and Bobby knows this, this, this road we've traveled. Um, we decided uh, decades ago, about four decades ago, to work on bettering our institutions serving our community. 
And so we did that and we built new institutions. We build a, um, a process so that city taxes can go into communities of color, which was not happening, you know, uh, when I first came to Austin and later. And, um, and Barry and I spoke yesterday about, uh, about something that we have kind of neglected to do in the Latino community. And maybe there are other communities that have done that too. I think the community of women also have neglected to do this. And that is to develop nonprofits that are responsive to our needs and that are getting uh, public funds, you know, to work with our specific community. So we have super huge nonprofits but then when they get super huge amounts of money, you know, it doesn't really get to the grassroots. And, and I think that, uh, Barry, I would love it if in the future, uh, your nonprofit organization would host, um, you know, an informational kind of seminar as to how underserved communities uh, can team up with, with uh, successful nonprofits to get some of these tax dollars you know, in the community. During COVID, we discovered that we were sorely lacking in uh, organizations that could reach uh, the grassroots and therefore a lot of the funds have actually gone unspent. I mean, I just wanted to say that. Well, I'll commit to bring together you and Bobby, myself and Kate, and we will, as soon as we can, sit down, start planning on that and do something. I think it's a big need. So we'll do it. And now I'm on tape. I'm stuck doing it now. I have one more uh, question. Yeah, actually. go ahead. Uh, it's, it's for Kate, kind of. Uh, Kate, would it be possible for all of the books that um, Martha had recommended earlier, if we could get that sent to us, the list of the books? Because I wrote down most of them, but just in case I missed any, because um, I am an avid reader. Absolutely. Martha, do you have a bibliography that you could send us? I really don't, uh, but I will be very happy to send you uh, what I consider some of the more basic texts. Um, there's a, an amazing book, but it is really, really tough reading. I mean, you know, it's, it's really one of those long, long scholarly things. It's Raul Coronado's A World Not to Come. And, and that book, that book encompasses everything that I studied for 50 years to get to the understanding of our political <laughs> essence. And um, instead of hating him, I love him, I adore him. It took him 10 years to write. And um, he's a scholar, I think he's now at Harvard, uh, but he was a Stanford scholar at the time, a very good friend of my, uh, my daughter's, and I, I really adore him. And it's a world not to come, and I will send that in. And it's actually Texas-based, but it's very important because um, it tells you how, why it is that we are different from the Anglo political uh, identity. You know, why our political identity is communal, you know, and why, you know, we have uh, these issues with uh, contrasting uh, politics and policies and the way that we approach uh, politics because, you know, he, he says we come, you know, not from the Luther Reformation tradition that, that helped develop our political identities in the U.S., but we come from the Thomas Scholastic tradition that is a, a different approach to dealing with authority, you know, with uh, political representation. And it is really amazing. And I'm, I studied that book because I'm working on uh, a process of getting us into successful strategies for developing citizenship identities. You know, if you look cultural citizenship, if you look at the African American community, they use their cultural institutions as vehicles as, as to strategize uh, political movement and political power. And uh, other communities of color uh, need to use their cultural, I think, you know, their own cultural institutions as they identify them in strategic ways, you know, to help propel 
them into the citizenship, into gaining full citizenship. So that book for Latinos, it is extremely important to understand. It's an intellectual history, but it also gets to the point to where we can understand our values as a mixture of two communities. I wish I had done more with the indigenous and, and someday we can talk about the indigenous community. But one of the reasons why women didn't get the vote in Mexico and women were so marginalized in Mexico, including my grandmother, my mother, myself, is because when they developed the constitution in Mexico, they went to European sources of information, European political philosophies and not indigenous which were communitarian, more along, they were more along the scholastic Thomas lines than they were on the Puritan reformist lines. They were more communitarian, they were more equitable, they were more equality based, recognizing full human beings for everybody, et cetera. So that book is an excellent one and I'll add it to the list. Um, have you read or would you recommend because I just got this book um, this week and I haven't started it. It's called No Mexicans, Women or Dogs Allowed. My uh, my oh, grandmother yeah. actually told me when I was little, she said, Mija, you have to realize that when I was here, mm -hmm. when there were signs in Houston, Texas that would say no Mexicans, no dogs. We couldn't go in the restaurants. We couldn't ride the bus, Mija. You don't, you don't know what you've lost. You don't know what we fought for. And so then I found this book called No Mexicans, No Women, No Dogs. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's what my grandmother was talking about. So I haven't started reading it yet, but I just got it. Yeah, well, Cynthia, just for background information, is the sister of Silvia Orozco, who runs the mm -hmm. Mexican Museum. Yes. And they're an amazing set of sisters. They're like super sisters, like the Tierra girls. And, um, and that is an excellent, excellent, excellent book. You know, uh, when I was in high school, we traveled. To, to Midland, Texas, and other places in, in that part of the state, and we could not get food. We could not. Mm -hmm. Our uh, Anglo teachers had to go and buy stuff, you know, at McDonald's, just like um, uh, como se llama Woody Allen did in Bananas. <laughs> you know, go, go order like 10 million hot hamburgers for us. Uh, we could not get served. Let me tell you, Things like this really politicize people. I mean, really politicize people. Thank you for sharing that. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but um, we will include on the webpage and send it out to everybody who's on this call, uh, whatever books Martha sends us. Um, and I would just pick up that um, in uh, March, we will be focusing on the indigenous uh, Native American folks. Um, and hopefully we'll have you back to speak in that, in that context. So uh, to bring this session to a close, I just wanna say what a joy it's been having this conversation. Um, your wisdom, your authenticity, your warmth are just absolutely amazing. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed this and I hope everybody else has as well. Thank um, you for coming. In terms of closing, uh, I wanna thank you all for watching and participating in this program, Civil Society. I wanna thank Kate, our uh, managing producer and coordinator at the Center for Nonprofit Studies for her support. Um, if you wanna read more about Martha uh, and as I said, the bibliography, uh, it will be up on our website, uh, nonprofit Austin slash civil society. I wish you all a Good day. And again, thank you very, very much for the light you brought to us today. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you next Thursday in our next session.